the students who I think have worked on being flexible and okay with not knowing are just in a much healthier place to move forward than the students who rushed to complete in three years and then now are finding the plan I had for myself through no fault of my own through I don't know a global pandemic is not working out the way I thought it would and because they haven't practiced that flexibility they're having a really hard time So my parents are immigrants, right? My parents are immigrants from the Philippines. They came in the 70s when um, there was a dictatorial regime in the Philippines. And they were, they took advantage of how immigration law in the United States had become opened up post-civil rights. So they were able to come to San Francisco. And my parents, I think, would never consider themselves political activists, would never consider themselves radical in any way, but they always worked to give me and my sister an understanding of our identity as, as Filipino, right? As, as, as the daughter, really, of immigrants, working class immigrants in particular, who were like just hustling to survive, right, in the United States and were, and just made, I think, the sacrifices that I see so many of my students and parents make to, to send their girls, me and my sister, to really good schools because they knew education was the key to social mobility, right? Um, my parents had, my father, or both my parents had been able to emigrate because they had sisters who were nurses. And um, their nursing status was heavily recruited by hospitals in the United States. And their education, right, was really the key to literally a different life in another country. And so education for them, there was a concrete evidence that education could fundamentally change your possibilities of life, right? And so they instilled that in, in me and my sister. But at the same time, like I said, they always taught us about our culture. They always taught us about the homeland that they came from and could not go back to because of the dictatorship. They were incredibly involved in their church, which is a predominantly Filipino church in Sacramento. And they were really involved in what, what I would call mutual self-help um, organizations that were grassroots that emerged in the Filipino American community in Sacramento and were there to really help that community navigate U.S. society and, and like survive, like just hustle and survive, right? And so, you know, like I said, they, my parents would never call themselves community organizers. They would never call themselves political or radical in any way, but they lived it. If, if that makes sense, right? They were always invested in their community, primarily through their church. They always had an awareness of their position in the United States, and they weren't afraid to talk about that with me and my sister. It was really in college where I took a, a seminar in Asian American literature, specifically Chinatown literature. And I just had this incredibly epiphanic, intellectual, personal moment where I was reading all of these novels and short stories and literature by Asian American authors, specifically set in Chinatown, had never seen anything like it in high school. And it was just this like affirmation in these beautiful language, right? Of everything I had sort of been kind of aware of through osmosis with my family and, and, and the place I grew up in, the community I grew up in. And then my professor was also the first Asian American woman I had ever been taught by. And just to, to have that class with her and to hear her lectures about this history that I knew nothing about, about these waves of, of immigration, right, that came from Asia. And to see a critical reflection and to have the critical language to like understand where I came from, you know what I mean, was a really eye-opening a very impactful moment for me. And, and that destroyed my mother's dreams of me becoming a lawyer, basically. It made me realize that I was like, oh, I want to I wanna study this more. And I didn't necessarily want to be a teacher. Like, I just wanted, I was hungry. I was just hungry to learn more about it. And um, the more I learned about, like, Asian American studies, Asian American literature, Asian American culture, it, I knew that it was a field of study that was also like deeply practical in that what I was learning, I couldn't help but want to also put into practice or observe in the communities I was coming from, right? Um, and so it just was this really amazing time for me in college to have like this experience. I went to the University of San Francisco, 
again, I majored in English literature. I minored in Asian American studies. I, I interned at all of these incredible grassroots organizations that worked in the Asian American community in San Francisco. And then that professor whose class I took, an EDI class, I was required to take it. She ended up becoming my mentor and really helped me decide that I wanted to go to graduate school. And that's how I ended up at UC San Diego. we live intersectionality every single day. You know what I mean? Like I am not just Filipino. I am not just a woman. I am not just a professor. I'm not just a US citizen. Like I'm all of those things simultaneously. You know what I mean? And like for me on one level, if we don't think about how all the different aspects of our identity intersect, then we can never really know ourselves just as people in these really comprehensive and complex ways. And then we can't really even know how or why we relate to other people in certain ways with certain dynamics, right? Like, why is it so important to think intersectionally about like yourself and society is because like, that's what it is, right? <laughs> like you like, I'm, I'm not, I'm just not my age. I'm not, just not my address. Like I'm just not my citizenship status. I'm all of these things all at once. And every other person I encounter is also all of those things all at once, right? And so where we sit at the intersection of all these different aspects of our identities do make us incredibly unique beings, right? And if I can't have an understanding of all of how all of those different aspects are converging for me, right? And shaping how I see the world and shaping how other people see me in the world and shaping the opportunities I have or the opportunities I don't readily have, then there's this real, I think in some cases, painful lack of awareness about that, right? And a, a, a real painful lack of awareness about where other people are coming from and how they may or may not be capable of relating to you or that they may not even realize that they need to make the effort to relate to you and understand that your experience of the world is going to be significantly different from their experience of the world, right? So I think intersectionality on even just an interpersonal level is important because you're not going to have a sense of who you are and who other people are. And then if we zoom out even further, right, macro, like, society is super complicated, right? There's, there's, it's, money does tend to make the world go round, but it's not just about money, right? Like, it's not just about class or economics. It's also, again, about gender and sexuality and religion and language and geographic location. And, you know, if we don't, if we're not practicing thinking in really multidimensional and complicated ways, we're never going to understand the infinite complexity of this world, right? Um, and so that's also why I take an intersectional approach when I teach writing and U.S. history and U.S. culture in the program I work in, because I think we need to practice that kind of complex and dynamic thinking just to have really important self-awareness, right, and social analysis. So now this is not to say it's easy in any way, right, and I think why that's not just sort of the default way of analyzing or understanding the world, right? Like in high school curriculum, for example, or even any kind of curriculum before you get to your EDI course in college. And even then you might not get it in your EDI course in college, right? It kind of depends on who's teaching that EDI course and what that EDI course says it's about. I, I think because it is hard, it is hard to think in intersectionally. It is hard to think multidimensionally. It is hard to think about how my privilege, for example, as a college professor exists simultaneously and contradictorily to my position as a woman of color, right? Like it's undeniable that I do have power and privilege in my position as a professor and a director of a program in the context of UCSD in the classroom. But that also doesn't erase the fact that I'm also identify as a woman and I'm a woman of color in a, in a place with a long history of not really being welcoming to women and women of color, right? And so for some people, understandably, it can be really difficult to uh, both understand and teach that simultaneous, simultaneousness and that contradiction. But that's the way the world is. The world is simultaneous and contradictory, right? how U.S. society is understanding or confronting or avoiding race post-George Floyd is really important and significant context to consider too. And as you point out, we are a STEM 
campus, right? Like on one hand, it's great, right? That yes, we have this EDI requirement and all students at some point need to engage with issues of equity, diversity, inclusion, broadly speaking, right? But on the other hand, it also creates this like, okay, I did that in that quarter. And now I no longer have to do that, right? And really wrestling with issues of diversity, right? Really uh, wrestling with issues of like justice, right? Or equity inclusion is not done in one quarter, right? It's like a, a lifelong, it should be, or can be a really a lifelong intellectual like process and emotional and personal process. And so this has been a very important question, at least in the conversations I've been part of on campus, which is like, well, if as an institution we're committed right, to racial equity, we're committed to just equity in general, diversity in general, right, inclusion, justice, you know, all those, these large issues, then, yeah, it can't just be within one quarter or one class or one department, right, like, how are we engaging students around this in as many aspects as possible of of their student life, and I think that is a really hard answer to give you, right, because, there, it, we're fighting against a lot of this kind of calcification of perception that the sciences are objective, the sciences are neutral, the sciences are apolitical. And, you know, as someone who is a student of and a practitioner of feminism, and particularly feminism that comes from women of color, there is nothing that is not political. Everything is political. And so even you saying this is not political is probably political, right? <laughs> um, and, and you know, to claim, okay, well, the sciences are neutral and apolitical and like we, we sh- this is not the place, right? To have these conversations about intersectionality and equity. Well, that just protects the fact that the STEM field is a predominantly white and male field. If there are individual students, right, who are amazing STEM, and I've had them, amazing STEM students who have, who have a very passionate interest in, in like ethical responsibility, right, and like social progress, and they're really trying to engage and like take ownership of their major and their discipline, they're doing some incredible on the ground work, right, of like horizontal mentorship, mentoring other students who feel underrepresented. They're seeking out mentors of their own. They're creating like mutual aid and support for each other and and asking really good questions, exactly the question you're asking, right? Um, And then there's, you know, faculty, individual faculty within departments who recognize this and are trying to show that, well, you know, if even if like in physics, we're not going to have a conversation about race per se, we can talk about, well, why, why are the physicians, the you know, great thinkers in physics that we study, why, why do they come from this specific background and not other backgrounds, right? Or if we're thinking about physics in the Western sense, what about physics in different, like indigenous understandings of the universe, right? Or non-Western understandings of the universe? How are they in conversation with and complicating, right? Western understanding of physics, for example. So in sort of expanding the intellectual terrain that you're in, involved in, you know? And then it, there has to be like departmental and administrative, and I'm talking higher administration, university movement to recruit and retain faculty of color, right? And researchers of color, because I know one of the great, um, like amazing things for me is when I meet students, particularly young self-identifying Asian American women who tell me I'm the first professor they ever had who looked like them. Sometimes the first teacher they ever had who looked like them, right? And so there are these multiple levels, I think that the university is trying to engage in, right? To show that STEM in particular is not divorced from or separate from these questions of intersectionality and equity and diversity and and inclusion. Advice I end up giving all the time or the suggestion I end up giving all the time is like, it's so fantastic that you have ambition and you have plans, but can you be flexible too? And like, just try things, you know what I mean? Like, just try, like, don't be afraid to try things. Cause even if you try it and you're like, oh, I didn't like that. Then at least, you know, that you, it's not wasted time. You know what I mean? Then at least, you know, oh yeah, no, really. Yeah. Microbiology is, is my jam. That's really what I want to do. But if you tried this other thing and you're like, whoa, maybe public health, right? Like, this is really interesting. You know, I really like this. And I think that that's like, that's, 
the one thing I, I feel I find myself saying to my students at UCSD over and over again, right? That like, that just don't be afraid to try new things. Like, just don't be afraid that if it sounds interesting, then go check it out. And if, if it's not, you know, not the place for you ultimately, then okay, at least you tried it. You know what I mean? And then you'll have no regrets because I just feel like the level of like drive and anxiety I see in so many of my students, like sometimes like just genuinely breaks my heart. How can we find permission to play, like literally play, you know what I mean? Like just try things out. College is the time to like explore, like explore your community, explore like yourself and like your interests and like whatever I can do to encourage students that that is completely normal and natural not to know not to know is great. That's why you're in college. You're in college because you don't know. So you want to know, you want to find out and you only find out by like trying things out and like embracing that potentially not liking it or potentially it not going your way is part of the like process of learning and experiencing the world. I get a perverse pleasure from accomplishing lots of things at once, but it's not always the, in that, you know, the most healthy thing for us. And For me, it's like, why do I feel that pressure to take on so much? Why do I feel that pressure to overwork, right? Is it because I've internalized this idea that I only have value or worth with these accomplishments? Because that's really sad. You know what I mean? Like, that's really sad because I have value and worth simply because I have value and worth as a human being, you know? And like, that's, I see this so much with students, especially, you know, teaching a general education requirement, everybody has to take. And again, we're on a STEM campus and they all see the writing classes as GPA killers, right? And they, and it's just so hard when you have students who, especially in their first year, first quarter, who can't, you know, were big fish in little ponds, right? And always had the best GPA, the best grade. And then they come to UCSD and there are lots of big fish in a really big pond. And then when they get that first grade, that is not the A they have always gotten. And I can see in their face that the, a, that the not getting an A becomes this existential reflection of their quality as a human being. And I'm just like, that is heartbreaking. Like I've been there and I get that. I was always a good student too in high school and college. I understand, but it's like, why? Why have you reduced your sense of mental health and sanity and well-being to a letter in Canvas? You know what I mean? And and it's just like, how can I? Yes, this is a this is a very contradictory position. I am your professor. I am teaching the class, but how can I also encourage you to see that like what I'm teaching you for, like why I teach the class is actually I don't give a shit about your grade I just I just care that you have a space to like ask questions right and 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 hate to say this many of the times the best questions are the ones that I cannot answer right it's just that I'm helping you ask them because if I can help you learn to ask questions that are difficult or no answer immediately that is the best skill you're ever going to get in your life because as you graduate college the level of unanswerable questions increases. And if you cannot sit with the anxiety and knowing that those, that question has no answer, it's gonna be a hard adulthood. I would say ask for help. I would, uh, yeah, because I feel like, again, so I, it breaks my heart when I see students who were really, really struggling in my class. And like, I didn't even know they were struggling until like week seven or eight. And then when I have a conversation with them, because maybe they've missed a bunch of assignments or they're not really showing up to class or just something has happened, you know, then they tell me, well, you know, I just didn't know how this worked. I didn't know. I didn't know how to get the readings done in time. I didn't know like what this essay should look like, or I couldn't access Canvas, I didn't, you know what I mean? All these things. And, and I just felt, you could tell, I can tell, it's because they felt ashamed. They felt like they should have known, right? They felt like they sh- if they don't get it, it's like all on them. Um, and that everyone else is doing great, right? They're only looking at everyone else's like Instagram or Facebook life and not really seeing like the truth of like the difficulty that they have every single day. And I always like, I, my heart goes out to them because every time I'm like, I I just wish you had asked me for help. Like that is literally my job as your professor, right? I don't go into my class and I'm like, how can I fail as many students as possible? You know, like that's not, that's not what I'm here to do. 
Um, but I, I don't know how to give you help or make accommodations or support you if I don't know that you're struggling, right? Or if I don't know that this is unclear or that this is confusing. Um, and so, you know, especially in a program like DOC, we have a thousand students every quarter and it's, you know, a really big and complex class. Like, I definitely really appreciate when I have students who reach out and are like, I'm so confused. Like, I don't get what's happening here or I don't understand what you need from me because that feedback is so helpful for me so that I can either, if I can, intervene, change, shift what needs to be shift, shifted within the course so that I can support the student. Right. Um, but again, like I can't do that if I don't know you need help. So ask for help, advocate for yourself, use your resources. You're paying so much money to come to this institution and you're, you're putting in so much energy and so much effort into your coursework. And if we can just fight against this idea that if I'm struggling, it's my fault and mine alone and I need to solve that. If we can just address that and be like, well, no, 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 no. Like you're part of a learning community. You're part of this university. You're part of this college. You have a right to ask for help. You know, that's what I would want to say to students, right? If you're struggling intellectually, academically, socially, personally, emotionally, mental health wise, like you deserve the help. You should ask for the help. Thanks for watching. Hit the like button and comment with your own thoughts and experiences. If you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe to our channel at Real Life Videos. Let's rehumanize.